Uh, my name is Jim Caseman. I'm back again. And again, then we're talking about the life story of uh, Jim and Kathleen Caseman. And um, like I've been saying at the introduction, because there's always people that, you know, join for the first time, that uh, I'm sharing the first 29 years of my life, which is not really, really good. But I believe that pe people may play it and they're thinking, having the same problems I was having and thinking, well, if Jim can make, Jim Caseman can have all of those problems and get his life turned around and become a minister for now over 49 years, uh, then there's got to be hope for me. So I know it's uh, now from this point on, uh, we get into things really going downhill with the drinking and drugs. So about the middle of January of 1964, <clears throat> I am having all kinds of, I, I don't know, I had a hatred for, never did have a relationship with my father. And it was not a good atmosphere. We never read the Bible at home or prayed at home. Went to church unless there was something else to do. So we just had a religion and we were raised Lutherans, American Lutheran. And um, the drinking was really, 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 really regular weekend parties. And and uh, now I'm, uh, it's, um, I'm having, I'm really getting, well, well, in my drug supply, which in those years was barbiturates and other stuff like that when a friend of mine had been, was working in pharmacy and he was transferred. And uh, so in a sense, my drug supply then was cut off. I did not realize, I didn't understand alcoholism. There was no teaching in those years about alcoholism and drug addiction. There just wasn't. And so when I look back now, I, I couldn't get high anymore without the drugs. And uh, so I went to, full-blown whiskey, Canadian whiskey. I would carry a half point and half point, half pint in my pocket and um, had to have that whiskey. And, uh, and still that couldn't get me up there as I look back now, but that really didn't work either. And so I was getting depressed. I, as, as I look back, that must have been what it was. And then I had this hatred for my community, I uh, really don't know why, <laughs> except that I would come into town and just terrorize the cops, you know, I would just uh, harass them and, and then they'd try to catch me and outrun them and head out of town that ever could catch me. And um, just, just ornery. And I, and I was the only one ever, ever arrested for ice skating. <laughs> in the middle of the winter, I would be ice skate. I was uh, ice skating on the Wishick ice skating pond, getting in the way of all the other people trying to ice skate, but I was out there in the middle of the ponds twirling around with my car, <laughs> ice skating with my car. And of course, that uh, caught the attention of the police and I was arrested. Ay, ay, ay. So it was a mess. And so I was getting these thoughts. You know, my favorite grandfather, of course, was Grandpa Dunner and my uh, mother's father. And um, he didn't have any much love lost for my father. Neither did I. So he was my favorite grandfather. And um, uh, then I was getting, these voices were coming to me. Now, I never read the Bible. So I didn't know hardly anything about God, you know, just that he is, my understanding was he created everything. He's out there somewhere. And, and nobody knows if you're going to make it to heaven or not. It's just once you die, then you appear before God and he sorts you out. You go to hell, you go to heaven. And that's kind of all I had. Didn't even understand that there's a real devil. They talked about hell and heaven, but there was, that was not a reality. And so these voices were coming to me. Now, initially, you know, I thought it was my grandpa and uh, talking to me. And uh, then the voices came and said, the world would be better off without you. 
Now, that's the first time I ever had thoughts of suicide. And I, of course, I never read the Bible, so I did not know that in Corinthians it says that we're to cast down all thoughts and imaginations and every thought and bring every thought and obedience to the Word of God. And uh, I didn't even know, like I said, that because I never read the Bible, had never read the Bible. And so that was news to me. And so then, I, uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God to pulling down strongholds. Verse 5, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into the obedience of Christ. Well, I didn't know that was in the Bible. I didn't know Jesus, didn't know anything. But nobody really wants to die. And so when those thoughts would come, I'd cast them down. <laughs> And then it's like it says in the first chapter of the book of James, the, the, the temptations come and then they go out again, like, like the waves of in, the, in, the, in the ocean. The, the waves come in, then they go back out again. Well, I cast them down, but a little bit while later, here they come again. And I'm thinking about it, and I cast it down. What am I up now? You know, I, like I said, nobody wants to really die. But you know, those, those thoughts kept coming back every other day, they'd be back. And pretty soon, I, I, the thought was, I needed to take my car, put the pedal to the floor, and hit this concrete bridge abutment as fast as the car would go, just hit the bridge. And um, then I'd cast that thought down. And I don't know how long that went on, for a couple of weeks at least. And then finally, I just, uh, I would share it with people. See, I was crying for help, but again, nobody understood this alcoholism and drug thing. And I would, while we were drinking, I would say, oh yeah, I've got this dream, you know, that I'm driving down the highway and then this bridge gets in front of my car. And people, nobody ever responded to that. They just looked at me, kept on drinking. They did not know what, how to respond. And so then, it finally came to the place where I just, you know, faith comes by hearing and hearing and hearing by the Word of God. But that principle works, you can work it in reverse. And so I was meditating and speaking death. And of course, the more I spoke it, the more faith I had, I guess you would say, to hit that bridge. And I finally, I was living in Bismarck then, at that moment there in February, and a uh, bachelor apartment. And so then I stopped at, I was in Wishik in my hometown. I stopped at the farm then and on my way to back to Bismarck. And I uh, told my mother, I said, you know, I, I have this dream, you know, I'm driving down the highway and this bridge, you know, gets in front. And she just stared at me. She absolutely didn't know what to say. And anyway, I, I said, I, I, I said goodbye. And I went to, back to Bismarck, 100 miles away. And I decided that this is it. Tomorrow morning, Sunday morning, um, I'm going to hit the bridge at 11 o'clock. So I'm back in Bismarck, and of course I had already made a tape for my parents on a reel-to-reel -reel and, and got everything in order and with a note and stuff like that, you know, so that when I was dead they could read it and hear the tape, what I had to say, which wasn't good. And uh, But that night... You know how when you yield your mind to the devil, it is just nothing but demonic. Well, I ended up at Jerry's Supper Club, and uh, in, in uh, Mandan was just across the river from Bismarck. And of course, all my friends were there, not all of them, a lot of my friends were there. And of course, we were drinking and, and getting really drunk. And I see that I'm about ready to run out of time. So I guess I'd better save <laughs> the rest of that part for the next session. Okay, bless you. Talk to you in the next session.